Amazing community is just such a gracious, warm community. Absolutely. I've come up with a theory on that. People have told me you kill people in your books, but you're also nice in real life. And I think it's because we get out all of our hostility on the page. We kill people fictionally so that we're just very happy to be out among the public and sane after that. I like that. That That makes makes sense. sense. Sure. (laughs) Annette, what advice would you give to aspiring mystery writers? I have three pieces of advice that I like to give out to aspiring writers. First of all is to hone your craft. Keep learning, keep studying, always try to improve. The second bit of advice goes along with that, and that is to find a writing organization or a writing community because it takes a village. It takes a lot of networking to get anywhere. And then my third bit of advice is to simply not give up because it's a very difficult business publishing. And the only way that you're guaranteed of not getting published, though, is to stop trying. So never give up. Oh, that's very true. That's good advice. Can you tell us a little bit about how your publishing story went? Sure. As I said, I started in 2003, 2004. I wrote what I thought was going to make me the next Stephen King of the mystery world. (laughs) I took my masterpiece into a writing retreat that did a critique on the first night. And there were some multi-published authors there and they made me cry. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) It was shattering. You have to develop a thick skin in this business. And I hadn't gotten there yet, but that helped. Still though, even though I cried, I realized a couple weeks later that it was probably the best thing that could have happened. Otherwise, I would have kept working on this story that was really bad. In hindsight, it was really awful. And I would have just kept slapping band-aids on a hemorrhage, basically. (laughs) So I put that aside and I started writing series that was set in the world of thoroughbred horse racing. I've had horses for 25 years, not race horses, but I had I had some connections in that world. That first book in that series got me my first agent. So I thought I had it made at that point, only to find out that I didn't. The book didn't sell. I wrote the second in the series. Since the first one didn't sell, my agent couldn't sell the second one either. So I started writing a different series which happened to be Circle of Influence, the first in the Zoe Chambers series. My agent and I parted company somewhere along that line, and I started querying other agents and wasn't getting anywhere. It was back and forth between the racetrack one and this Zoe Chambers series for a while until I had the opportunity to be in a car ride with Hank Phillippe Ryan. She's a good friend. We've been friends for years. And she was at Mystery Lover's Bookshop in Oakmont, PA. And I offered her a ride to the airport because I live fairly near the Pittsburgh airport. And during that ride, I had her for 45 minutes as a captive audience discussing which of these two series I should continue with. And she said to me, which one are you passionate about? And it was quite clear to me in that moment that I needed to follow through with the Zoe Chambers series. Now, I've told this story in a couple minutes. This was actually about nine, ten years in the making to get to this point. And my husband, who had started out being very supportive, was getting to the point where he kept telling me, when are you going to get a real job? And he mentioned slinging burgers at McDonald's would pay more. And I'm a vegetarian, so that wasn't really a good match. (laughs) (laughs) I set myself a limit that I was going to continue to query agents for the Zoe Chamber series for six months. If I wasn't getting any bites on it, I was going to start shopping it around to smaller presses for another six months. And if it still hadn't gone anywhere, I was going to either self-publish or just give up and go find a job. And I was getting kind of down to the wire when I was introduced by email to Kendall Lynn, who is the acquiring editor at Henry Press. And she requested the full manuscript. Ten days later, called me and offered me a three-book contract. That was late 2013. It took me 10 years and 10 days to get published. Oh, wow. So perseverance. Yes. Hence what I said before, don't give up. (laughs) Yes. We know you're coming to Malice Domestic. Yes. And uh, we look forward to meeting you in person. 
Look forward to it too. What other events do you have coming up that we can let our listeners know about? I have another book coming out, Fair Game releases May 14th. So I have a number of local appearances here around the Pittsburgh area for that. And then I am going to BoucherCon in Dallas this fall and still booking other events as we go along. But the two travel events that I have right now are Malice and BoucherCon. Very good. Net, thank you so much for agreeing to be on the show. And oh, my pleasure. We're so excited to meet you face to face at Malice Domestic. You all the luck with the Agatha Awards. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Enjoy your day. Thanks. You too. And now we go on to our third and final for this episode, Amy Hicks. An inability to pass the site requirements and a deep aversion to federal prison prevented Amy from lying on her FBI application, so she set her deficient eyes on what most Northern Virginians do for work, the non-law enforcement side of federal government. After 20 years as a contractor, she retired and turned to murder. Her first book, What Doesn't Kill You, has been nominated for a Lefty for Best Debut Mystery novel and an Agatha for Best First Novel. Amy lives in Virginia, enjoying LASIK correction eyesight with her family, three dogs, and all her killer thoughts. Welcome, Amy. She is an Agatha Award nominee for Best First Novel for her book called What Doesn't Kill You, which is the first in the Willa Pennington Guy Mystery series. Hi, thanks for having me. Tell us a bit about yourself for our listeners. I'm a native Northern Virginian, which is kind of like saying you're a unicorn. It's a very transient area, the DC metro area, because of all the military bases and all the changeovers in presidential administrations. But I was born here and I've lived here my whole entire life in some of the various counties. I was a federal contractor for years and years, two decades which is pretty much what everybody does for work here. I have a husband and a daughter and three dogs. Oh, you have a lot going on down there. (laughs) I do, yes. How did you react when you found out you were nominated for the Agatha Award? Honestly, they call you ahead of time before they make the official announcement. So I guess they made the official announcement on Tuesday. So Sunday night, I get a phone call. And because I don't recognize the phone number, I don't answer it. And they leave a message. So, okay. So I check the message and I'm sitting in bed and I've got my pajamas on and I'm, you know, reading a book and I'm listening to the message, just kind of half listening to it, expecting it to be one of those, you have been scammed by the IRS call data. (laughs) Oh, yes. And I hear the name. Hi, Amy. This is Janet Blazard with Malice Domestic. And my stomach instantly, it somehow dropped and raised at the same time. It felt like it completely left my body. And I start to get like tingles, like like pins and needles all over my body. I was completely and utterly blown away. I started screaming. The dogs flipped out. They're jumping on the bed and barking. My husband and daughter are running up. I can't tell them anything. I just play the recording and I just play the voicemail again. And we're all jumping up and down and we're so excited. Malice is what I like to call my happy place. I've been attending, I think this year is either my 14th or 15th year attending just to get nominated for best first at this place that I've been a part of since before I started seriously writing. It's so mind-blowingly amazing. Well, this will be our first year, and we are beyond excited. You are going to have so much fun. It is such a wonderful, warm, friendly. I mean, we kill people professionally, and yet there's so much hugging and so much, I love what you're wearing, and you'll go to the banquet, and the awards will be given out. And you see people genuinely happy that somebody else won the award that they were up for. It's that kind of place. Well, we've heard from some of the other nominees that when people say it's nice to just be nominated, they said in this instance, it really, truly is. It is. Yeah. It's so hard to explain. I love the people that are nominated. They're my friends. I want them to win. I want us all to win. I want want everybody to be happy. I love them all so much. That is great to hear. Amy, how did you get started and what drew you to the mystery genre? 
I'm not an only child, but I'm the youngest of four, and there's a very large, over a decade expanse between me and my siblings. So when I was in preschool, my brothers and sisters were graduating high school and moving out. So I became very much like an only child. I would tell myself stories. I would spend summers up in the mountains in Western Virginia with my aunt and my cousin. Because it was the late 70s and the early 80s, we were outside all the time, except when it rained. We would play board games. But the board games could get a little contentious. Just be clear, I have a pretty thick emergency room file, and at least two of those visits are plastic hotel related. When that would happen, we would get separated to our own rooms. And my aunt had stopped at a flea market and bought a box of Nancy Drews. Once the Nancy Drew bug bites you, you're a goner. You're in the mystery community. That's what happened. And so I've always loved them. I've always thought they were amazing. Afternoon movies, after school, when I would come home from school, there was no Oprah on. There would be movies that would come on after a general hospital. And I would watch them and they would have themes. I fell in love with the Maltese Falcon and Big Sleep and all of the Humphrey Bogart movies. And then as I got older, it became Carolyn Hart and Death on Demand. And then after that, it was Malice and all my amazing new friends. What advice would you give to aspiring authors? My first piece of advice is read. Read like it's your job, because it is. Watch mystery movies, especially old noir films like Double Indemnity or The Big Sleep, and listen to the dialogue and listen to how it sounds. If you can afford to, go to Malice Domestic, go to Boucher Khan, go to Left Coast Crime, meet people, listen to what they say. But just the number one thing is write and find your voice. There's only so many plots in the world. In varying combinations, somebody said there's only like 25. So nothing is ever going to be different. How you do it is what makes it different. Your writer voice is what makes it saleable, but also readable. People find a voice and if it's compelling, they'll read it even if your main character is unlikable, even if they're unreliable, the girl on the train. They'll read it because the voice is what compels them to keep going. So find your voice. That's great advice. I never really thought about it that way. It does amaze me how different writers can almost take the same theme, but give it their voice. And it's a totally different book. Mary Higgins Clark is a really great example of, A, she just basically created a genre, which was this domestic mommy suspense kind of thing. But it's the most horrible story. Why would you want to read about somebody losing a baby or a child being kidnapped? But her voice is so compelling because she puts you inside the story. Stephen King, he writes about the most fantastical, improbable thing, but his voice is what carries through. We know you're going to be at Malice, and yes. we're so looking forward to meeting you in person. What other events do you have coming up? Well, I actually have a very cool event that I had never heard of before last fall when I was invited to participate and help them as a local liaison. It's the American Cultural Association, Popular Cultural Association. They're doing a week-long conference in DC in late April. So I will be appearing on the Mystery Writers Roundtable panel on that Saturday. I think it's April 22nd at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's 90 minutes and John Copenhaver, Sherry Harris, Ed Amar, and uh, Cheryl Head will be joining me to talk about mysteries and the mystery community in DC. Then I have Malice, which is, don't tell my husband, but my favorite place in the world. <laughs> I'm sure he would love it to be like, where we went on our honeymoon, but no, nope, it's Malice. <laughs> <laughs> and then in June, I'm actually going to be at the American Library Association's annual conference with my publisher at my publisher's table signing books. And then hopefully, we haven't gotten the acceptances yet, I'll be in Suffolk, Virginia at the Suffolk Mystery Authors Festival. This will be the sixth annual one. That's August 10th. And then over Halloween, I will be in Dallas at BoucherCon. We're hoping to eventually get there, too. Since we're in Maryland, we have these things called real jobs. <laughs> yeah. No, no. My very first voucher con was November before What Does It Kill You came out in Toronto. So this will only be my third. And I've never been to Left Coast Crime. Unfortunately, it's in Vancouver, which would be a full day of flying for me over here on the East Coast as well. And with my daughter, college acceptances and 
today is my husband's birthday and happy birthday to <laughs> thank you he is yes today is his birthday he's off at jujitsu class with our daughter and her two best friends it just wasn't gonna work for me this year so of course i'm nominated <laughs> for, an, for an award there too.